We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. After Joanne disappeared, uh, my dad would get up early in the morning, have a shower, go off to work. Then he would come home, have another shower, grab the little lunch pack that mum had packed for him, and he would go out searching for Joe, just searching for any signs of the girls, going around speaking with people, hoping that someone somewhere saw something that could bring the girls home. On the 25th of August 1973, 11-year-old Joanne Ratcliffe went to the football with her parents and her 14-year-old brother at Adelaide Oval. A couple of times during the game, she did a favour for an elderly lady who always sat near them and took her four-year-old granddaughter to the toilet. The last time they went to the toilet was during the third quarter. In fact, it was the last time either girl was ever seen by their families. Like the Beaumont children seven years earlier, the girls disappeared in broad daylight from a public place where they were surrounded by literally thousands of people. But unlike Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont, there were a number of credible sightings of Joanne and Kirsty being snatched from Adelaide Oval that day, and they're horrifying. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Susie Ratcliffe is Joanne Ratcliffe's sister, although there's a surprising twist to that, which I'll let her tell you about shortly. Susie founded an organisation in memory of her missing sister Joanne It's called Leave a Light On, and its mission is to assist other families with loved ones who never came home. October is a special month for Leave a Light On, and Susie joined us to tell us why. She also tells us about how Joanne's loss has affected her family. But we start off with some things about missing people that we all need to remember. It's not a crime to go missing, and that's something that's that's very imperative that, that people understand. You know, uh, people go missing through so many different reasonings and quite often, you know, there might be because there's a a family dispute, Um, you know, people go on on holidays or go on a retreat or, you know, they've moved house and they lose contact. And unfortunately, a lot of them feel that once they've been out of contact with family for some time, that they feel that they haven't got the right to be able to contact their family again because they feel that the family's going to be angry with them. But quite often over the years that pass, families forget all that anger and that angst. They just want to be able to know that their loved one is safe. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't imagine anyone would not want to hear something. It's just, Mm. you know, just whether it's a a phone call to police, Mm. you know, um, or actually fronting up to a police station because they need to have visual Mm. ID. Um, But, you know, just or, or a phone call to family, say, yes, I am okay but I just don't want to make contact at the the moment or I don't want to actually personally see you, just to know that people are okay, you know, because it's the the not knowing, you know, it's it's an emotion that no family should ever have to endure. I can see it's still very, very emotional for you. Well, it is. I mean, it's, it's been 46 years now since my sister disappeared. I never had the opportunity to meet her. I was born 14 months after Joe disappeared. So, but I have grown up knowing all that there is to know about her. Uh, I was very lucky, uh, for want of a better word, that my family were very open in talking about my sister. Even though it was incredibly difficult for them and incredibly emotional, they would answer any of my questions. Uh, you know, but it's it's the same with so many families. The not knowing, it just, it is, it's completely heartbreaking and it's its something that you can never get over. How many kids did your parents have after Joanne disappeared? Just myself. Just you. It's interesting because I think a lot of us feel like, oh, it'd be so hard to have another baby after a child went missing. Um, gosh, you must have been very precious to them. I was. Well, I was um, I was basically classed as mum's miracle child. Mum mm-hmm. uh, didn't even know I was she was pregnant with me until she was about five and a half months. Wow. And then uh, when she went and saw the doctor, he said, oh, having a child will help to keep you sane. 
Mum often told me over the years that uh, she believes I probably sent her insane. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of pressure on you, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Oh, yes. You know, mm. I tried to do my bit. <laughs> Even my daughter says she takes a lot of responsibility on herself and she's always saying things to me like, oh, you know, you always say nobody ever helps you and I try and I always think I've got to help you more. My like, younger she's daughter person. does that too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you must have felt an awful lot of pressure. I did. My, my parents were, were very protective. Um, sadly, my dad passed away. Um, eight years after my sister disappeared through, he had pancreatic cancer and they believe it was brought on through stress. Um, and, you know, that left mum um, on her own. Um, my older brother, um, who's 16 years older than me, um, he stepped in and, and pretty much took on the, the father role. Did he? And still very young yep, to do yep. that. Um, and he has been, you know, he's not just been a brother for me, he's being a dad and and one of my very best friends and you know I admire his strength and and you know my mum was has always been my inspiration uh, sadly she passed away in March this year not knowing uh, we had really hoped that we would finally have answers before she passed but I'd like to hope that she's now reunited with my sister um, and finally can can rest in peace. Giant's disappearance is one of those stories that the rest of us growing up were told as a cautionary tale because um, the family was out watching the football. Everyone was doing the right thing, weren't they? Yeah, and it was something that, you know, they, they did every week. You know, they, they were always off to the football. Mm-hmm. Um, the SANFL um, Football League, they were, you know, it was, it was big in South Australia and mum and dad supported Norwood Football Club so they would venture off to the football nearly every weekend. Mm-hmm. Who was the, the older of the two girls? Was it Joanne or Kirsty? Uh, Joanne. Joanne was 11 and Kirsty was four years old. And 11, I was babysitting at 11. I was babysitting neighbourhood kids. And certainly at an event like that, I would definitely have been asked to take a smaller girl to the toilet. It's amazing, like so many times over the years, um, you know, through my sister's Facebook page and, and even now through through Leave a Light On, we have a lot of people comment and saying, oh, you know, I can't believe that, you know, a child of that age was given responsibility oh. to, to go to the toilet or even in the, in the case of the Beaumonts mm. with Jane, Anna and Grant, you know, the it was it's, it's common for a lot of people to say, well, you know, why was Jane given that responsibility to mm. take the two younger kids down to the beach? But a lot of people don't realise that, Back in those days, it was so completely different. Yes. And Adelaide especially. It was just like a little country town, not like Melbourne or Sydney where, you know, a lot of a lot of people now say, oh, we never would have done that, you know, at that age. I don't know then. what it is about the internet and social media that brings out the vilest comments in people. Mm. It's just amazing the, Isn't it? the comments that, that I, I read and oh. I delete a few good, off good. of Leave a Light On. Yeah. Um, you know, mainly being because we have such a large following of families Mm -hmm. and friends. Yeah. And I know through past experiences how heartbreaking it can be to read some of the really vile comments. Mm. And, you know, the last thing we want is to be able to cause any more angst or anguish for families having to read those comments. You know, we ask for total respect to families, Mm -hmm. no matter the circumstances behind the disappearance. Because at the end of the day, these people that we're trying to raise awareness of are somebody's loved one. And it shouldn't matter the age, the race, the religion, the ethnicity, the circumstances behind their disappearance or what they might have done previous to their disappearance. They're still loved and they're still dearly missed. And anyone who would want to hurt them with a comment to entertain themselves is a disgusting, disgraceful human it is you can't apply today's thinking to back then like my mum they would holiday with cousins in Adelaide and she said they'd go they'd all go off to the beach a big group of them one of them might have only been 10 or 11 or something and Joanne was 11 years old when she took Kirsty a family friend um well actually my parents had never actually met Kirsty prior to that day as I mentioned before mum and dad used to go to the football nearly every weekend and they'd quite often um, go to the Adelaide Oval to watch their beloved Nord um, play. Uh, When they went to the Adelaide Oval they always usually sat in the same 
uh, stand, the Sir Edwin Smith stand. And quite often there was another lady there who they eventually made friends with, Rita, who was Kirsty's grandmother. The day that the girls disappeared, uh, Kirsty's parents had actually gone away for the weekend, so Rita was looking after Kirsty. So Kirsty needed the toilet, yeah. and of course they helpfully said, Oi, Joanne. Yeah. Take yep. little Kirsty. Joanne was, was very mature for her age. She was she was very responsible. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had had always been taught stranger danger and to look out for for people and if you've given her given a responsibility you stick with it and that's the sort of person joanne wants although she was only 11 she was very mature and very protective of anyone that was in her charge Uh, they went off to the toilet and came back there was not an issue and then later in the third quarter uh, Kirsty needed to go to the toilet again so Joanne offered to take her and off they went but when the siren sounded for the end of the third quarter straight away mum started to get a bit worried because it was a, a, a rule in our family that the kids weren't allowed to be wandering around in between the the, the quarters mm. just because there was such a large number of people like there was over 10,000 people at the game that day mm. um, so it was it was sort of within our family that, you know, we weren't wandering around With when, the, when the quarters were, were in, in between. So mum and I went off to try and find the girls. When she couldn't find them at the toilet, she went back to let the, the others know. Um, mum and dad and my brother had a quick look around, couldn't find them. And uh, that's when they went to the announcer's office to ask to have a, it put over the PA. And by this time, of course, the fourth quarter had started back on. Um, so by that stage, the rest of the area must have been pretty vacant really, wouldn't it, because mm-hmm. everyone's in their seats watching the game. Yeah. So you can have a pretty good look around by that stage yeah. for two little girls. Yeah. And your brother's about 14, so he's pretty helpful mm-hmm. and they just know where to be found. Right. Mum and Dad went to the announcer's office to ask them to broadcast it over the, the radio. Um, Mum was denied entry by the guard. Um, but he did not realise the strength behind my mum. <laughs> um, and she's only a little woman, but mm. she had, she could. Well, in that moment, absolutely. Yeah, she could certainly, strength. Yeah, mm. certainly do what she needed to do. And she managed to push past him, but they were denied the announcement because they said it wouldn't be heard over the crowd. So my mum, my dad, and my brother went back and just wandered all around the grounds um, behind the the oval itself where there was the bowling club and the the tennis courts looking for the girls while Rita, Kirsty's grandmother, stayed in the stands just in case the girls come come back. back. The panic, you know, just imagining the panic, you know, it's it's, it's horrible. It's it's horrific. I know that uh, like my my daughter, um, she went to the toilet at uh, the complex where I work and she wasn't back within a few minutes and I straight away, I, I panicked, you know, I just, you know, because of my circumstances mm. and my history. Um, but, you know, it's something that, you know, thankfully righted itself within, you know, like 10 minutes, whereas, you know, m- mum and dad's anxiety was through the roof. And, of course, you know, falling on the, the fact that, you know, seven years previously the Beaumont children had gone missing in such a public area, um, you know, straight away mum and dad, you know, started to think something was definitely up. Because the disappearances of the Beaumonts and Joanne and Kirsty are often kind of thought together in a similar way, even though it was years apart. They're like some of Australia's greatest crime mysteries, really. There's only a a small amount of, of cases in Australia that are of... Um, multiple abduction. The Beaumont children and Joe and Kirsty, of course, are, are, are two of the cases. Um, and then there's a couple of cases up through Queensland as well. But there's there's not a, a large number. A couple of days later, a boy told police that he thought he saw a man forcing two girls towards an exit at the Oval. How much did police put in that sighting? They investigated as much as possible. Um, unfortunately, you know, Back in in seventy three, it was the day you know the days before video cameras and CCTV footage and um, and those like so it's it's really it's it's so difficult. Um, you know, he was just he was a a kid that was selling lollies 
um, in Adelaide uh, at the Adelaide Oval on the day um, and he'd taken a bit of a fancy to Jo. Um, he'd been watching her, uh, thought she was quite cute. Mm -hmm. um, so he his sort of sighting was police considered quite informative because he was so intent on watching her because he, yeah, you him. know, he was having a bit of a perv. Yeah. Um, but there were, there were a number of sightings um, which correlated with his information mm -hmm. um, of the person uh, that was with the girls on the day. They ended up with a, a tall uh, man, quite stooped, um, fairly thin, uh, long drawn face, mm -hmm. wore, wearing a, an overcoat and a, and a, a hat. Um, and the photo fit from the various witnesses were actually matched very similar to the one of the uh, suspect in the Beaumont case. And that's why the two cases have been linked quite often over the years. There was a, a gentleman who saw um, a tall stooped man uh, carrying a little girl and a la uh, an older girl struggling with him pulling on his arm, kicking him and crying. Um, they were sighted walking across the, the Torrens River, uh, not far from the from the Oval. He actually slowed down to stop and check to make sure everything was all right. But then he thought better of it because he thought it was probably uh, a father or granddad taking the kids home from the, the zoo or the park, which was within the vicinity, and thought it was none of his business and drove off. And it wasn't until following days when he heard the radio announcements that he realised that he had seen the girls. Um, he contacted me a number of years ago expressing how sorry he was and how guilty he felt for not helping. But as I said to him, he wasn't to know and he's not to feel guilty. We we don't feel any anger or angst against him at all. It wasn't his fault at all. Did it become national news immediately or was it more localised to South Australia? It was fairly localised just to mm. South Australia um, for the first couple of months and then it started to, to really spread. Over the years, there's been you know, reports that have come up that um, a gentleman in Queensland was a suspect because he, he fit the photo fit of um, who witnesses saw and also through circumstances that he was supposedly in Adelaide at the time. So the girl's case was quite well known in parts of Queensland as well. Um, but it certainly doesn't get the coverage or hasn't had the coverage that the Beaumont children have had. When I speak about Leave a Light On um, and I bring up the Beaumont case, everybody knows the Beaumonts, mm. whereas the, the Ratcliffe Gordon name or the Adelaide Oval abduction is not as, as common, uh, which is, is sad, not just for my, my sister's case but for so many cases. There are so many long-term missing persons here in Australia and there are so many of them that people have never heard of. It's hard to mm. know what makes a case stand out, isn't it? I mean, this is a classic example. Sometimes we can point out fingers at reasons mm -hmm. and sometimes they're really hard reasons to accept, frankly, even if they are obvious. But in this case, I don't know why your sister and Kirsty would not leap out in the way the Beaumont children do. What, what do you think? Do you have a theory? I think a lot of it is because, you know, it was the first real big case of children going missing in Australia that really got a lot of attention. The Beaumonts. Yeah. You know, the fact that it was there was three children from such a public area and they literally did just disappear like into thin air. Kirsty and, and Joe, even though it was sort of very similar circumstances, disappeared from a public area. They were sighted a number of times after they disappeared mm. from the actual oval itself. So it's not quite as mysterious. Yeah. But it's you know, I, I find with a lot of the cases that we, we research and a lot of, like with the families that we deal with, the media uh, play a very big part in what cases get the publicity. Even though, you know, like the police will, will give them information, the media play a major part in who gets more attention than others. Mm. A lot of it is, um, I find it's, it's quite discriminatory. Mm -hmm young, beautiful-looking women in a social environment, like very socialite. Mm -hmm. White women. They get a lot of publicity. Mm -hmm. Sadly, uh, Aboriginal people mm -hmm. don't get enough publicity. Yep. Uh, elderly people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
prime example is a young young woman went missing a couple of years ago uh, here in Victoria. She got front page coverage for a number of days and then when she was finally located, she also got a lot of publicity through the media, on the pa- in the newspapers, on TV, over the radio. At the same time, a dear gentleman who also went missing from here in Victoria, his remains were located just outside of Mansfield and he got a two-paragraph comment in the paper uh, and I think it was about page 20 and out of those two paragraphs, they still got two things wrong. Oh. And it just, it saddens me that, you know, each and every single missing person should deserve the same amount of attention. Yeah. You know, as I said pri- previously, they still, they're someone's loved one. And if, you know, someone from the media had to go through the same situation, they would try all they can to make sure that their loved one gets as much publicity as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone deserves the same amount of attention. Did you feel as though you got the same amount of attention as a child? What sort of childhood do you think you had compared to Joe's? And we'll hear the answer to that question after the break. Coming up in Australian True Crime, Susie tells us about the moment her mother accepted Her sister Joanne wasn't coming home. But first, how did Susie's childhood compare to Joanne's? I had a very protective Mm. childhood. Um, I couldn't go around to a friend's place or go to the park on my own or, you know, even walk into school on my own initially. Plus your dad got sick. He must have got sick when you were quite young. Yeah, he he got – he was diagnosed with cancer um, only if he – few months before he he passed away but he I remember him being quite distracted um quite often after Joanne disappeared uh my dad would he was a a bread carter for Tip Top Bakery so he worked long hours but early hours so he would get up early in the morning have a shower have a quick bite to eat go off to work then he would come home have another shower grab the little lunch pack that mum had packed for him and he would go out searching for Joe. Really? Just searching for any signs of the girls, um, you know, going around speaking with people that hoping that someone somewhere saw something that could bring the girls home. Um, he died a very tortured man. Um, he never gave up hope to the very day he died that the girls would be located um, so much to the fact that two days prior to him passing, he actually called a journalist in from the advertiser and uh, and put out a plea um, to the public to not forget the girls, to not forget what happened um, and not to allow what happened to us to happen to any other child. And what about your mum? Was she, how did she cope? Oh, mum. Mum was what inspiration. She is, well, she was the most amazing woman I have ever met. Um, her strength and resilience through it all just, it astounded me. Um, mum's favourite motto was, you know, she just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And if she'd stumble and fall, she'd pick herself up, brush herself off and keep on going because there are people out there a hell of a lot worse off than us. And it amazed me that she could have that thought process considering she lost so much in such a short period of time. Her mum passed away just prior to my sister's disappearance. Um, Then, of course, my sister disappeared. Her brother had a massive heart attack and died in my dad's arms while we were out camping. And then my dad passed away. And then her dad passed away all in a span of 10 years, but she still held strong. And, you know, I, I often asked her over the years, you know, how could you stay that strong? She said, i got to look at her that I've got you mm-hmm. and I've got your brother. You know, I've got to stay strong for you. And, you know, she. Not everyone does, by the way. 
No. You know, no. we've we've spoken to people who've talked about their mums just not being able to parent yeah. after tragedies, who've just just had to medicate and not being able to. So it's it's difficult. Uh, nobody really knows, you know, how they're going to handle the situation until. Mm you're actually in it and mm. you always think, oh, you know, yeah, I'll be strong. Yeah, I'll be able to to stay strong for the family or I'll be able to do this and I'll be able to do that. But until you actually live it, yeah. you just, you never know. And, you know, it is it's it is such a struggle. Mm. It really is. You know, the, the constant feeling of not knowing and whether you're ever going to have answers. And, and she must have been feeling, what's next? Well, that's You must that's get just to an anxiety, a, yeah. you know. Mm. Yeah. Did she and suffer anxiety, do you think? I think she had un, un, undiagnosed depression and anxiety, mm. but, you know, she just kept putting on a brave face. She didn't like to cry in front of us kids. Um, and um, prior to my dad passing away, we um, we had a photo of my brother and sister on the mantelpiece. And from a young age, I'd always ask mum, you know, who's that and you know, where is she? Why isn't she here? And that's when, you know, once I was old enough to understand, that's when mum and dad told me about it. But I used to sneak out of my bedroom at night time and go out and talk to Jo in her picture frame um, once everybody was asleep and I could hear mum and dad crying in their bedroom. But they never did it in front of us kids because um, they never wanted to upset us. Um, and that, that, just, that just showed me, you know, the inner strength that, that mum had and I've always said that, you know, if I could be half the woman my my mum was, then I'd be bloody lucky because she was just, she was amazing. So when did you decide to give your life to other people who have missing people in their families? I'd been wanting to do something as a dedication to Joanne for a number of years and then in 2014 um, I'd actually had a, an interview with the detective inspector uh, from South Australian Police. Uh, I'd raised the the question about why there was only a two hundred thousand dollar reward um, into the disappearance of my sister's case when there are a there was a, a known drug dealer um, had a five hundred thousand dollar reward into information on his homicide. I'm like, what made his life more important than than our girls? or to any other missing person. And through my perseverance, um, we finally got a million-dollar reward for my sister's case. Congratulations. Along with um, the Beaumont children, uh, Juan Morgan, Rihanna Barrow, Michaela Goodell, um, and a number of other children. Um, and after that, I, I thought to myself, you know, if I can do this, if I can help to get this sort of attention to these cases, what else can I do? Um, and it was then that a, a friend of mine actually contacted me and we were talking about it and he said, why don't we organise something, you know, on the, you know, in relation to the anniversary of Joanne's disappearance? Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that'd be good. But then I thought, well, why should we limit it just to Joanne and Kirsty? Why can't it be all missing persons? So by putting our heads together, we come up with the concept of Leave a Light On. Uh, Leave a Light On was actually uh, through uh, a parent's idea. Uh, Mum and Dad used to leave the front porch light on after Jo disappeared so that if Jo ever, jo ever come home, she'd know that we, we'd be waiting there for her. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a symbol of hope um, and a symbol that, you know, they'll never be forgotten. Such a great symbol. I love it because it's very Australian as yeah, well, yes. leaving the porch yep. light on, yeah. you know, for somebody. Leave the light on. I love that. It's As you described before, it's really lovely that you – it's so inclusive for everyone mm -hmm. because, as you said, not all disappearances in ambiguous circumstances mm -hmm. are treated the same. No, they're not. And it's, it's, it's disgusting how, you know, in today's day and age there is still so much racism mm -hmm. and discrimination. Also discrimination against – drug users, sex workers, you know, we see those cases all the mm -hmm. time where they just don't get the media attention because no. people go, oh, well, she was a drug addict prostitute. Exactly. Know. You know, it's just kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, you know, it happens. No. Why should that be any less important? Exactly. exactly. And I see that 
with the Aboriginal people as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I have contact with a couple of families and, um, you know, it saddens me. I, I listen to their stories you know, I speak with speak with them, you know, quite regularly and, you know, the, the stigma surrounding, uh, you know, the disappearance of Aboriginals is, is disgusting. You know, oh, they're probably just drunk. Walk or they're walk prob- about. Yeah. How about the myth of people being oh, walk about for the, crying I, out loud? I hate that word. It's so I hate ridiculous. that word when they just, they, they attach it to any disappearance yep. of an Aboriginal person mm. and the whole, oh, they're probably lying drunk in a gutter mm. somewhere. Mm. That's... That is a stigma that they put on all Aboriginal people and it is, it's it's disgusting. Let's talk about some cases that you would like to bring attention to on that mm-hmm. note mm-hmm. and we will put their details on our social media. Yeah, Steve Williams went missing um, out of South Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh, lovely young man. Uh, he went missing in uh, 2005. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a member of the, uh, the Gypsy Jokers mm-hmm. uh, motorcycle club in uh, in South Australia and yes he might have had a bit of a bad past he had skeletons in their closet but hey who doesn't yeah have skeletons sure. um but he was very much against pedophiles and child sexual abuse uh, and played a major part in creating um, a group against child abuse he was the sort of person that would give you the shirt off his back if you needed money He'd try and help you out as much as possible. Uh, one story that was shared with me was a young man who had um, fallen off the rails a little bit, wanted to come home here to Victoria to see his family but couldn't afford to. Steve paid his way. And it made a world of difference. It helped to get him back on track and, as he said, it helped him basically to save his life. And that's the sort of person Steve was. There, as I said, yes, he might have had skeletons, but he has a beautiful, loving mum and a gorgeous daughter who would dearly love to know where he is. If he has passed away, to at least know where his remains are so that they can bring him home and bury him with the love, dignity and respect he deserves which everyone deserves. I can't imagine, and um, you of all people can speak to this, I cannot imagine not knowing where the remains are of someone I love and a member of my family. It's so difficult because you can you can never really grieve. Mm-hmm. You're, you're in a constant state of limbo. Um, as one family member said to me near the start of Leave a Light On, she said it's like a nightmare that you never wake up from. At least when when someone you love passes away, you can have a funeral, you can bury them and you've got somewhere to go and grieve. So once you begin that grieving process, you can start to heal of a sort. It's still emotional, it's still traumatic, but you have some sort of resolution. You know they're not coming back. And you were saying earlier that your father died still searching for the girls every day of his life. At what point did your mother, do you think, accept that Joanne wasn't coming home alive? I think mum accepted the fact that Joe wasn't coming home alive when we moved from Adelaide up to Cooper Pedy in 1986. That's a big big thing to do to... She's left the light on literally Mm -hmm. every night in case Joe comes back and then to leave that house and move, that's big. It was, but it was through a number of reasons. One, of course, was mum, I think, finally come to the resolution that Joe wasn't going to walk back through the door. But it was also I was the same age at that stage um, when we moved and it was a week and a half prior to the anniversary of my sister's disappearance that we actually left Adelaide. And mum didn't tell me until only recent years that one of the reasonings why we did leave was because she was scared that the same thing was going to happen to me because I was the same age and around the same anniversary. That's interesting. The, that was more powerful. Yeah. That fear was more powerful yeah. than the holding on yeah. to the But it was hope. just, that's just, you know, some of the, the thought processes that go mm-hmm. through your mind, you know, when you have a missing loved one. You know, a lot of people, you know, I speak with, they say, oh, you know, that's, I don't know why that family is thinking that. It's, that's an irrational thought. Yeah. But the, the thing is, is that 
when someone go, goes missing that you love, the thoughts that you you have can be quite irrational. Yeah. They can be all over the place and you will, you'll think of every known aspect that you possibly can mm. to think, you know, what might have happened and what might not have happened. I see that man coming back from Belgium whose son yeah. was in Byron. Mm -hmm. um, I just think, yes, of course, you'd want to be there, the yeah. last place he was. I mean... We logically can say, well, the kid must be dead. I don't know, yeah. you know, but that's where you'd want to be, right? Well, that's just it. There's there's a family I deal with. They live in the UK. Mm. Um, their son, Stephen, went missing in Queensland. The most beautiful family. They've travelled back to Australia a number of times searching for him. Unfortunately, Stephen's dad's now got dementia. Oh, no. And so it's, you know, they can't make that trip anymore. Right. So... For me, that intensifies mm. my push to make sure that Stephen's never forgotten. We have we we share Stephen's story at our function in October, but we also share his story on our Facebook page throughout the year. And it's it's people like that that you know you know that they're they're still holding on to hope, but unfortunately, age is against us. Yeah. Tell us about Stephen. Um, Stephen was, um, he'd come over to Australia. He was uh, doing tree lopping, um, goldsmith, and uh, he'd been travelling around. He'd been based in um, in Queensland for a little while and he was quite happy. He always rode home to mum and, and dad, spoke with them quite regularly on the phone and then just suddenly disappeared. They've had no contact with him. Leslie, his mum, as she said, like if he doesn't want to come home, that's fine. Just a letter, a phone call, a message, anything, just to know that he's okay. But unfortunately, there's been nothing. Does anybody, does your husband uh, or any, do you have kids? I have a daughter, yes. Do, do any of them say mum or say, babe, good on you, we get it, helping people is wonderful, but this is not good for you or, you know, you're giving too much to other people. Does anyone anyone ever think this is too draining for you? A couple of people have. Mm -hmm. um, my brother showed extreme concern prior to the concept of Leave a Lot. Well, he knows better than anyone, right? Yeah. I was quite obsessed with my sister's case mm. um, and he got to the point where he was extremely worried that I was becoming too obsessed and that I'd follow in the footsteps of my dad. Mm. and he said you need to take a step back and I said I can't you know I have to do something I can't let Joe be forgotten which is one of the greatest fears not just for myself but for all families is that our missing loved ones will be forgotten as the years progress and he said well you know you can still raise awareness for her but just don't become so obsessed with it so by creating Leave a Light On, um, it has become somewhat of a healing process for me, knowing that Joe is not going to be forgotten, but also knowing that you know we're helping to raise awareness of so many other cases that people would otherwise not be aware of mm -hmm. and to make sure that we continue to provide as much support for families as possible. How does he go, your brother? He struggles. Mm. He's the old uh, ostrich head in the sand um, person, which is the way he deals with it. And that's the thing is that everybody deals with it differently. My brother was extremely close to Joanne. Um, they were the terrible twosome. If there was mischief to be found, they'd be right in the middle of it. <laughs> um, and he was there that day to have was, yep. your sister sitting there with yep. you at the football and then just – go to the toilet and yep. not come back. And that's the thing is that Dave has blamed himself so often over the years. Mm. Um, he's always felt that he was at fault because if he'd have been with the girls that day, they'd still be here because, as I said, they went everywhere together. You know, if David was somewhere, Joanne was not far behind and vice versa. Um, and unfortunately, you know, just one moment in time, you know, changed everybody's lives. And yeah, but I mean, there's only one perpetrator, right? The person who exactly who took the girls. Yeah, there's mm. there's only one person to blame here, mm -hmm. and that person I'd like to hope is 
10 feet under mm. uh, with fires burning his bum. But, mm. um, you know, it's it's something that, you know, we can't blame ourselves for. Mm. And, and that's something that I say to so many families, like they can't blame themselves. Nope. Did Dave marry and have kids? Uh, he did, yes. Um, he's married. He's got three kids. Oh, good. Uh, he's now grandpa. Really? That's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, poppy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, he's he's fantastic. You know, That's I, wonderful. I love him to bits. Um, you know, we, we have our fights, we have our spits, but, <laughs> you know, as all brothers and sisters do. But um, You were a miracle in that family. Yes. I really think you were. Yeah, Gosh. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, they... Um, you know, I've I've always been close to my brother. We, as I said, we've had our arguments over the years and we've drifted apart a little bit, but we've always managed to get back on track. Mm. And um, you know, he he sadly separated from his first wife, but his he married a few years ago. And um, yeah, his his new wife, she's fantastic. You know, she she really understands him and and gets him. And you know, when he sort of gets into those moods, she just gives him a toe on the butt and yeah. come on, get back on track. So. Yeah. Um, you know, she's been amazing, especially this year. We've had, it's been such a hard year for us losing mum. Mm. Um, and Trisha's just been a, a huge tower of support for Dave. Um, so, so very lucky to have her in our lives. And your husband? Uh, uh, my partner, yes. Partner? He's, um, he's very supportive. Wonderful. He's been really supportive. We, we started Leave a Light On in 2015. Tell us about Leave a Light On in October. What do we need to do? Okay, so on the 21st of October, we hold an event where we ask people around Australia or even internationally um, if they can leave a light on as a show of support for families mm -hmm. but also to show that we'll never forget missing loved ones mm -hmm. and it helps to brighten the path home for those. Uh, we also hold a function every year. Uh, for the first two years, we held it in Adelaide and for the last two years, we've been here in Melbourne. Uh, this year we're actually over to Launceston and um, with our function we have a couple of guest speakers. This year we are very honoured and very privileged to have Sally Layden speaking about her mum, Marion Barter. From The Lady Vanishes. I met Sally a couple of years ago. She's an amazing woman and her strength and resilience yeah. in never giving up is it's inspirational yeah, for it so is. many other families. Sally has had so many hurdles thrown her way since her mum disappeared, but she has never let that stop her. And she's a very strong woman. So very proud to know her um, and very privileged to have her at our event this year. You can find links and more information about Leave a Light On on our website, Facebook, and Patreon pages. Thank you for downloading Australian True Crime. We'll be back next week.